On June 25, 1982, the classic cyberpunk thriller Blade Runner was released. Initially, it was met with middling reviews and a mediocre box office reception. The US cut of the film was meandering and choppy, with awkward pacing accompanied by an even more awkward voiceover by Harrison Ford, which he had intentionally given a poor performance to, in the hopes that it would be found unusable. It was not. They don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession. All of this was capped off with a saccharine, happy ending comprised of unused helicopter footage from Stanley Kubrick's The Shining that failed to match either the tone nor the themes of the rest of the film. All of this led to the film being received as a work that, while visually stunning, was ultimately lacking in substance, with one reviewer going as far as to refer to it as science fiction pornography. Blade Runner came and went, finding a small fan base, but seemingly destined to be yet another pet favorite among a niche audience. However, in the Warner Brothers film vaults, there existed another cut of the film which, though still rough and incomplete in its own right, flowed much better, included numerous key scenes that were nowhere to be seen in the US theatrical release, and, most notably, lacked both the horrendous voiceover and awkward happy ending. This was the work print cut, which had been the first version put together under the supervision of director Ridley Scott himself, and was the cut of the film that had been shown to test audiences before being re-edited for its final theatrical release due to feedback from those screenings. This cut was eventually found in 1989 by film preservationist Mike Ulrich, and before long found its way into a film festival where it was met with considerable enthusiasm. This all culminated in the release of the director's cut, the version of the film that led to the now legendary status, influence, and critical acclaim that Blade Runner enjoys today. This series of events marks one of the few times where an artwork has been released in a state where it hadn't quite yet met its full potential, before a later reworking of the base material would come along and completely change how it was perceived, both publicly and critically. This is an exceptional story. In the world of film, this is almost unheard of. However, in the world of games, it's the norm. About a year ago, I reviewed Final Fantasy XV at launch. I found it enjoyable, but also undeniably uneven in its pacing and incredibly spotty in its core plot composition. It was a game I liked, but also recognized as very flawed. However, the game we now know as Final Fantasy XV is not the game I had reviewed. They share a lot in common to be sure, but the current game we call Final Fantasy XV has entire mechanics and narrative plot points that simply did not exist in the Final Fantasy XV that I played. And this is only taking into account the free patches that have been released. Once we factor in the paid DLC that will inevitably one day be considered standard content, Final Fantasy XV 2018 becomes a very different experience from Final Fantasy XV 2016. As such, the review I penned is now completely obsolete, and this kind of review obsolescence is not rare. For better or worse, we have found ourselves in a world where games are overwhelmingly not finished when we receive them. Be it a simple bug patch or an entire array of post-launch content designed to support the base game as a service for years after its release, the games we get at launch are almost always altered or added to in some way. And this poses an important question that no other art form has really had to deal with. When is a work done being made? Should we consider games complete when they're officially released, even though we know they aren't actually complete? Or should we look more to when they receive their final patch? How should we be approaching reviews of early access games and games as a service? How do we deal with games on a critical level whose quality, for better or worse, changes from launch to the final version? In short, when should we review games? For the past four decades, we've continued to review games in the exact same way. Game comes out on a specific day, it gets reviewed, and that's the end of the story. Unless something considered to be an expansion pack or re-release comes out, or some kind of controversy demands that the review be revisited. It's a model of review taken directly from how other art such as film and music have historically been reviewed. And back when games were what was in the box and nothing more, it was completely functional. However, as games and technology have matured, this approach to review has grown increasingly wanting, as the games they are meant for change faster than the reviews can be reasonably expected to keep up with. We now live in a landscape where articles on upcoming patches have become a form of bread and butter content for major publications, and it's generally considered a bad omen if a developer says or even implies that a game about to be released will not be receiving any post-release patches, almost as though it's an admission that the game isn't worth supporting. We clearly value patches and post-launch support, and given the immense impact they can have on a game's quality, rightfully so. 
Yet outside of competitive games, it's rare to see any kind of meaningful writing on how patches affect the game they are being introduced to. This is especially odd given the rise of games as a service. Works like Splatoon and Overwatch that receive constant and consistent updates. Such games very quickly begin to morph and change immediately after release, potentially leaving the reviews meant for them in the dust. At launch, the original Splatoon was widely criticized for its lack of content. However, by the time the final patch rolled around, it had become one of the most content-rich multiplayer games out there at no extra cost to the consumer. Its quality had significantly improved, yet there only remained reviews that reflected a game that no longer existed. And this is before we even take into account what a game in this vein can look like after over a decade of tweaks and changes. Team Fortress 2 is essentially the granddad of this kind of development, having been released in 2007 and receiving continued updates and support to present day, over a full decade later. And in that time, the experience TF2 provides has drastically changed. No one can reasonably say that TF2 2007 had the same tone, content, or even mechanics as TF2 2018. However, in spite of these drastic changes, the most recent review I could find was written four years ago, before the matchmaking that debatably defines the game in its modern form was even added. As such, we have a highly successful game with a large player base that has received little to no critique simply because the drastic changes to the game were made after its supposed release. We also got to see the flip side of this problem earlier this year, with the early access runaway hit Player Unknown's Battlegrounds dominating sales charts basically from the moment of its release. Yet with only a few publications writing reviews on it due to the fact that it was supposedly unreleased. Yet here it is. Incomplete but completely playable with a community made up of literally millions of players and asking for your money. If any product has ever begged for critique and consumer awareness of its failings, it's PUBG. But despite its staggering sales and cultural impact, the reviews had not been entirely forthcoming from major publications until recently, because Bluehole hadn't put a 1.0 in a patch name. And all of this is to say nothing of the increasingly common occurrence of games that are, for whatever reason, released broken and incomplete before being patched into a complete, respectable work. As time goes on, the official launch window for many games is proving to be less and less likely its defining time. Yet we still treat it like it always is. It's the only time a publication is ensured to talk about a game's own quality. And Metacritic, being what it is, refuses to take more than one score from any publication for the same product meaning the first review is usually the last as far as they're concerned. This is not an ideal situation for anyone involved. For critics, it means the reviews become worthless shortly after publication. For game developers, it means a lack of publicity for potentially game-changing content additions. And for consumers, it means potentially missing out on games that were released broken before being worked into a gem. And a lack of insurance that the game they're buying is still the game they were originally told it was. Our current model of review is frankly, incapable of filling the role that reviews need to. Blade Runner was allowed to become a classic because we were permitted to revisit it after an altered version of it was released. We need to grant games the same right, especially given how often and how fast they change. This isn't a call for a new review to be written after every single patch, or even a re-review of every game after release. This also isn't a hate letter against DLC or patches. As misused as those things can be, Ubisoft, they are ultimately a cultural good that won't be going away anytime soon. However, we are not doing these artworks or ourselves any favors by so often ignoring these alterations that can redefine the experience a game provides. We need reviews, from birth to death. Reviews for games released in early access, for games that have officially launched, for games after they have received their final patch and occasional re-reviews or addendums to long-standing games that are consistently adding or altering content. We've been letting unfinished games be sold for years with nothing but word of mouth to protect consumers, in between limp assumptions that a game's failings will be patched later, all while ignoring great games that have become worthwhile after a bad launch. Revisiting art is essential to the growth of any form, and this is a task that needs to be undertaken by both critics and the general audience. It's up to us to take a critical look at games not only when they're first available for purchase to protect consumers, but again, when the version of it that will exist the longest is finally set in stone so we can examine it proper. Otherwise, who knows what we might miss.
I would like to take a moment to thank Sam Natchison, Kevin Thurber, Keith, Black Mage App, as well as everyone else who is currently supporting me on Patreon. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. I love you all. Peace.